So the idea of flipping the classroom is we ask the students to learn the fundamentals before they get to class. And then when they get to class, we go through examples, we answer their questions, and we really ingrain the topic. And we do the fun stuff in class. Well, you know, in about 11 years of teaching, I've asked my students to read a book about this thick and come to class prepared and enjoy reading that textbook. And needless to say, they don't do it and we get to class and I have to go to the fundamentals anyway and we start at the beginning. So during this pandemic we were forced to go online and I thought you know if I couldn't flip the classroom before when we were in person how can I possibly do it when we're online and I was so surprised to see that it actually works much better. So in the next five minutes or so I'll describe how I do it and maybe it resonates with you maybe you can use it in your class. So let's talk about Bloom's taxonomy for just a moment. Now, ideally we get the students from the very bottom of this pyramid all the way to the top of the hierarchy and give them some elevated levels of learning, okay? Let's go through an example to show how I might consider using this flipped classroom in a strength of materials class. So let's say the lesson is beams and bending today. And before class, I wanna give them a video that describes beams and bending. Okay, so we're at the bottom of this pyramid and they're just learning to remember and understand the topic. Okay, so I'll give them these pre-recorded videos. Ideally, it's engaging content. Okay, so you've got this equation here. The resultant stresses from a beam and bending would be negative M Y over I. And already your eyes might be glazing over unless you're a structural engineer. And how do you get them to remember that, especially on a video? And well, you know that, I, I hope this is okay with you. I'd like to just take a detour here. Now, this all reminds me of, you know, when my brother was little and we'd be at the dinner table and my brother was kind of a troublemaker. He'd always take his spoon. Let's say we're having mashed potatoes this night. He would have mashed potatoes on his spoon and he would bend it back and he would aim it at my mom. And my mom would say, no, my eye. And, you know, she would get really nervous about that. And so he would bend it and then eventually he would flick it across the room and she would flip out, okay? So she was really concerned about her eye. Now, let's get back to the topic at hand. Wait a minute, the equation is MY over I, my eye, beams in bending, that's the stress, MY over I. Okay, so you can still be engaging on these pre-recorded videos and all of a sudden you can't unlearn what I just described of my brother bending the spoon and my mom saying, my eye. You might forget the negative sign, but you're way closer than if I just say, sigma equals negative my over i, okay? So that's what I mean by engaging videos, even if we're not in person, okay? Quizzes, really just for a gut check, just so the students have something at the end of the lesson where they're regurgitating essentially what you've tried to teach them, okay? I don't give quizzes that are too intense, and it's just enough to make sure that they watch the content, okay? Then I track progress, okay? There's software out there that allows you to track progress, and I make it part of their grade, too. So it's actually a decent portion of their grade to the tune of 20, 25%, okay? And then that's yet another incentive to watch the videos, take the quizzes, and pass all of them, okay? You can also do activities outside of the classroom. So during the video, I could say, you know what, go into your basement and look up and are your joists, your floor joists, are they deep or are they shallow? Are they just regular old floor joists like two by eights or two by tens? Or are they the wooden eye joists? Why are they shaped that way? Why do they have so much material at the top and bottom? So you can have them do engaging activities even if you're not with them, okay? We're at the bottom of the pyramid still. So let's go to the middle of the pyramid here where we're moving into applying and analyzing. So now we're back in class, okay? Now we assess their progress, whether this is in person or we're on Zoom or whatever our platform might be. We're asking questions, we're answering their questions to make sure they're at that minimum level where we hope they are, okay? Then we can move on and talk about previous objectives and how it relates, and then we can tie it to future objectives so that they know where we are in the grand scheme of things if they're more of a global learner, okay? In class activities, this is the bread and butter of this portion where we're practicing, we're ingraining the topic, we're doing demonstrations, okay? 
group work were, uh, were applying what they learned back in the pre-recorded video. Okay, talk about current events and case studies. So there was a recent hotel a couple weeks ago that collapsed and it was because of really long spans and the, uh, the beams and bending essentially weren't designed appropriately. So that really hits home when you can come up with a topic that relates to the objectives of the day. And then you can also assign homeworks where they can apply the topic. Now we're moving up in the hierarchy. So the last set, the last portion of Bloom's taxonomy would be to evaluate and create. So evaluate examples. So maybe we give examples of beams and bending, the shape, the geometry, the type of material, the loading scenarios, and we start to understand if this beam is going to fail or if it's going to work. Okay, and then we can move on and do some sort of in-class design where we're creating based on load scenarios and geometry. We can specify different shapes of beams okay, and material types. And then of course projects where whether that's partially inside the classroom or out, they can work together or individually and create. And then they're at the top of Bloom's taxonomy. So this would be the sequence I would suggest flipping the classroom, going through Bloom's taxonomy, and being able to do it really effectively online. Again, I was shocked that it worked. So let's go through some of the nuts and bolts in case you want to do this in your class. Now, I created a video textbook instead of the real textbook, and it just seemed to apply in this online environment. Plus, it seems to work better for the generation that we're teaching now. And what I did was I recorded a whole bunch of videos, and each lesson I assigned a video for the students to watch. And you can see an example here. This provides a lot of consistency for the students. And it's nice for them to go to one place every single time, not all sorts of different software programs. All right, and the quizzes were on here as well. The software platform that I use is called Thinkific. If you combine Think and Terrific, Thinkific, it's been a really nice platform for me. And maybe you could check that out. So it's seamless on tablets, phones, laptops. So if you start on one, stop, you end up starting again from where you left off, depending on your device. Okay, this is an image of a, a student operating an excavator and decided to watch the uh, video on civil drawings. Okay, so they can watch it anywhere. And I've found that they really appreciate this format much more than the thick textbook. Okay, they can speed up or slow down the delivery. So if I'm talking too slowly, they can speed it up on this particular platform. Or let's say they're an international student where English is not their first language, they can slow it down. And then you can also add captions for accessibility reasons and again for those students where English is not their first language. Okay, let's talk about how to edit and create videos. And students really appreciate professional audio and video. It does take a long time though. So I found that one hour of edited complete video takes 16 hours. So eight hours of planning, four hours of raw footage and four hours of editing, okay? It is no joke, but the students do appreciate the professional quality, okay? There's two ways to do it really. One would be screen capture like you see in the top where I'm not in the image and I'm just talking over slides. I suspect that many of us have done this before or you can insert yourself into the equation, okay? So this would be screen capture plus me, and that's what you're watching right now. Here's how to do it. So first of all, you need some sort of software. I use Camtasia. There's all sorts of editing software out there. Okay, you do need equipment, all right? So you need a camera. I use a DSLR camera. You could also use your phone, all right? The bare minimum would be that camera plus maybe a microphone. Okay, I use a corded microphone attached to my shirt. And then bonus would be a green screen, okay? That way I can splice myself nice and cleanly into the presentation, and then lights, okay? I ordered semi-professional lights online, but they were very inexpensive, and it took a while to find the right arrangement. But once you have it, you set it in place. Ideally, you can leave it there, and then your makeshift studio is in place, okay? So the equipment isn't too much of a burden. All right, let's talk about engaging content. So this is something we should do in the classroom anyway. It doesn't go away when we're online, okay? You can still have fun. You can still attempt humor. I attempt humor way too much, and the students have camaraderie around that because of all my bad jokes, all right? So it doesn't have to be funny as long as you're attempting to be funny occasionally. Theatrics, you see in the bottom left where I was a game show host, okay? 
can't really do that pre-recorded, but you can probably do that on Zoom or whatever you're using for the synchronous portion. Okay, competitions. Our students love competitions and it really gets them going. So if you can introduce that in class, that will encourage participation. Okay, relate to something they already know. All right, something previously in the semester or maybe something they walk by every single day on campus or something they see in the news. Okay, make it relatable. And then provide a topic to refer back to later. So we did that in this short video where, hey, what's that equation for a beam and bending, for the stress of, of a beam and bending? Oh, remember about my brother, you know, sending potatoes across the table? It was my I, negative MY over I. So that's what I'm talking about with providing a topic where you can refer back to it later. All right. And then also demonstrations. You can do demonstrations just like we did in class. In fact, sometimes I think it's better because they can see right on their screen zoomed in on the demonstration versus if I had this demonstration in the front of a huge classroom, you know, only the front row could see it. So in so many ways, I think we are actually in a better place for elevated learning in the classroom. Okay. So this was flipping the classroom using online delivery. Again, I think it's highly effective. I would have never said this a year ago, and I'm going to incorporate this in my class, no matter what happens in the future, whether we're back in person or not. Okay, I hope this was helpful. Thank you.